Hi, and welcome to Night Clerk Radio, episode 60, where we're discussing the music of Hiraith Records. I am Burke, and I am joined by my co-host, Ross, who would like to share some good news with you. Hi, yeah, I am launching a Kickstarter for another podcast I do. I am definitely not an uh, an addict addicted to making podcasts, Mm -mm. but... You may know uh, Leto Narrative Dissidents is another project. Uh, it is a limited podcast series about tabletop role-playing game design. Uh, it is co-hosted by Greg Stolze and James Wallace. And in each episode, we look at an individual game and review it in depth for a more detailed critique than a lot of other podcasts. For season two, we are going to also be looking at game mechanics in some episodes, like dice pools or alignment systems. And uh, also new for season two, we'll be having a private RSS feed for backers. So you'll be able to download them uh, straight to your podcast app without having to manually download them. Yeah. And so uh, we also have a PDF bundle of some of our games. Check out the Kickstarter page, which should be live by the time you listen to this. Season one is available on our public mirror site on anchor.fm. So you can listen to all 16 episodes on that. But yeah, if you like tabletop role-playing game design, it is worth checking out. Yeah, it's hesitant to say, but I guess it is similar to this, where if you like the idea of a couple of people having a conversation around one very focused topic, Mm -hmm. and you also like RPGs, then probably a pretty good mix for you. It's Greg and James are both longtime veterans in the RPG industry. Yeah, we're all, all three of us are published game designers. All three of you, yeah. Yeah, so it is a... Uh, look from, you know, actual published people. So uh, it's been fun and rewarding to do. Gave me excuse to read a lot of games I would not have otherwise done. And apparently a lot of our fans have told us that uh, not many RPG podcasts actually do what we do, which is like right. just look at a game and really dive into it. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, because that takes time to read a game and, and <laughs> yeah. think about it. So a lot of it is it tends to be either interviews or actual plays mm-hmm. or more current events. Yeah, like it, or like just stuff. basic like advice, like what to do with it right. in this. How to DM. Yeah, exactly. Like, so, yeah. but uh, yeah, so it's on Kickstarter now. It'll be on for a month and eventually all the episodes will become will eventually be released to the public. But if you back the Kickstarter, uh, we have stretch goals to do more episodes. We also have rewards. If you really want to be a big spender, you can even curate an episode and force us to review a particular RPG like, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Invisible Sun, which would be a problem for us because it's out of print and a very expensive game. But that, that'll that be our problem if we if we do that. So yeah. Yeah. what's it worth to you to torture Ross? <laughs> you have to ask yourself that question and answer it. Yeah, it's true. Within the next month. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, good luck with the Kickstarter, Ross. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, But today uh, we're talking record labels, back to music and and Vaporwave. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the music of Hiraith Records, which is a record label founded by Cat System Core out of the Netherlands. And I kind of chose this because in a lot of the albums and artists and genres we have been discussing recently, I really feel like I've become interested in the micro label or Mm -hmm. maybe Hiraith is is too big to be considered a micro label. You know, it's not somebody just making five cassettes in their basement or something. They do have extensive physical releases with every album. Yeah. I just kind of thought about that. So I was like, let's just pick one. They just had an album come out. So I saw them on Twitter and I was like, well, let's just do them. Yeah. Let's just, let's just get into it. Yeah. It's a good idea because uh, there's a number of these vaporwave, record labels that are started by artists. I think that's the important thing to note that this is mm-hmm. like, uh, started by someone who is, who put out some, their own albums and then like decided to help facilitate other people getting their music out to the world. And uh, that's really cool. And I'd actually been aware of uh, Harith records because the collaboration cat system core did with telepath in mm-hmm. building a better world was uh, something that like it was featured on Bandcamp. Uh, as essential ambient, you know, listening. And I was like, Ooh, the, yeah, I'd, I like telepath. So I was like, Oh, well this sounds neat. And so I listened to it and I got, you know, signed up on the email <laughs> list for her I record. So I've mm-hmm. listened to a couple of their albums over the last couple of years. Cause they started the album in 2019. Right. Yeah. And 
still release stuff up to this month, mm-hmm. which is one of the albums we're doing. So I just was trying to wonder, I don't know, maybe it's better suited as like its own episode, mm-hmm. but I, I do think that this, this micro label artist founded label uh, kind of self-publishing is so interesting mm-hmm. to me and, and also really important to kind of give power of artistic release back to artists. Probably actually one of my favorite things about Vaporwave is seeing all these artist collectives, you know, like all the Barber Beats people get together and release stuff together mm-hmm. or uh, other like-minded, similar genre artists. Yeah. And it's just one of those like centralization slash decentralization things. Cause it's not just like Sony mm-hmm. or I don't even know who are the major records anymore. I was going to say something, but I was Columbia. like, well, they might be out of business. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. all those. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that a record label can do that an individual artist can't, which is um, interface with the whole distribution of music, Mm -hmm. which the two ends ends of that being like physical and digital distribution. So you think, well, physical is obvious because, you know, releasing cassettes and vinyl requires a bit of like business know-how to navigate contracts and dealing with all that and getting things shipped out to people. And yeah, there's a lot of work to do with that. And that obviously helps to be able to do that competently uh, and that that's sort of mm. a little asking a little much of an individual artist to do uh, although some do it but digital distribution you know you know well i just upload my album to Bandcamp and people can download it well yeah but is it going to get on spotify and uh, are you going to be mm. able to make money off it uh, are you going to be able to get it listed on content id systems like for youtube and other other platforms so that you don't get dmca'd mm. and and taken down because you know the i mean the worst thing is when someone else just claims your, your music is theirs and just like literally fucking steals it from you on YouTube. Yep. Like as a bit of news, like the lo-fi girl 24 seven music stream was just taken down the other day because some Malaysian music company claimed the music was their own. And this is like a live stream that had been going on for over two years continuously. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got taken down because of a copyright strike. Now YouTube, because it's so big, YouTube is like, Oh yeah, we made a bad, We'll fix it. But like if you're an individual vaporwave artist, yeah. you don't have the tools to deal with that. And a record label, even a small record label would be is able, you know, business to business interface is able to interface with that a lot better. So there, there's a lot of advantages to setting up even a small record label. Yeah. Just the power of, of collective action, mm-hmm. right? Like building communities that are yeah less hierarchical and more focused on helping each other right. out. Because also, you know, the other argument around record labels, they can help you with, concerts and stuff right but oh, there's yeah, plenty yeah. of big wave collectives that also will help mm-hmm. artists get onto shows and stuff yeah so you really don't need them you know it can be self-organized mm-hmm. it's a lot of work and it's hard to have people that know how to do that but it is important when they do the lo-fi girl example is a, a really good example and my first response <laughs> like in my head when you posted the tweet mm-hmm. from youtube that they were going to correct it i was like man they must make more money than i realized because i've never seen youtube care about copyright strike trolling yeah because it's not an uncommon thing where maybe you'll use something that is royalty free, mm-hmm. like a piece of classical music, mm-hmm. but then someone will come along and claim like, oh, that's the, you know, London yeah. version of this Beethoven song. So that is copywritten. And you're like, well, no, that's not the one I'm using. But like YouTube doesn't care. Mm-hmm. I want to say I've seen it before, but it is entirely like justice is only for the popular. Like, like right. you need to have a certain level of uh, subscribers or views before YouTube will even notice you. And look like, girl, yeah, is like the stream is ended and it, it, you can see its stats. It's 20,000 hours and 668 million views. You can't you can't mm-hmm. listen to it. But like. You on the thumbnail on the, on the uh, Lo-Fi Girls YouTube channel, you can see that. So like, and it, I mean, it started a whole fucking genre. Uh, so like, yeah. Uh, and I, we have talked about other re- record labels too. As an aside, obviously, uh, Dream Catalog because of HKAE. Mm-hmm. Who else did we talk about? Uh, uh, the Dungeon Synth label. Oh yeah, HDK yep. Cryo Chamber. Oh sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, and those record labels uh, do a lot of help to get their people out their artists out into the world and on, on mm-hmm. uh, platforms and, and market. Yeah. Like you're, you're hundred percent right. Collective action, like Wolfi girl music. If they did all separate artists streaming, you, you know, they would have been, yeah. Would have been able to get any, any kind of payout or, or fame. So there's ups and downs, you know, the downs being like, well, the, the record labels can be, uh, maybe they take more money than they should. Uh, we don't know, mm-hmm. but like, uh, th- there's always that risk. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's always the room for being predatory, but I never got that vibe from no. a lot of the major still standing like vaporwave and ambient. Yeah, I don't labels. think I don't think it really happens in like vaporwave. But absolutely, I mean, you see so many pop stars mm-hmm. contract disputes and actually, and no, stuff. I take that back because I did hear a lot of stuff about Business Casual, which is a record a vaporwave oh. label. A lot of gossip on like the vaporwave uh, subreddit, uh, basically because they use PZA who was an artist notorious for stealing beats and songs and just claiming them as their own and just uploading Mm. dozens of albums. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe that was just because of PZA or yeah, I don't know. The business casual does release a lot of albums. If you look on their band camp page, they Mm. have hundreds of albums, I believe. So they've been going on since like 2013. So they've, they've got a lot. But yeah, no, I mean, like overall, like uh, record labels, especially in, in this genre, do a lot of really important and necessary work. One thing I do like is a lot of artists will release their album on their own Bandcamp page, but then go to a record label to get a physical release. Like Lost Angles does a lot of that. They do a lot of physical releases for individual artists. So I mm. quite appreciate that because I know I bought a couple of things from Lost Angles, like uh, that uh, one of the first albums we reviewed about the uh, concept album about the Dreamcast horror game. Um, uh, Night of Terror. Yes, yeah. I was trying to yeah. think about it. I was like, uh, yeah, I know the t- I know the artist's name was like high school drama teacher, <laughs> but like, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I I think we should do more episodes just focus on individual record labels because they do try and get a particular sound. They do try and get like, mm-hmm. I mean, at least some of like business casual. Uh, I, I, business casual is like pretty vapor, future funk, and like yeah. Harbor Beats kind of sounds. But Harith uh, Records does have a very particular sound uh, influenced by Cat System Core, but obviously not entirely trapped in, in Cat System Core because Cat System focuses a lot on ambient. Uh, not all of the music they re- mm. uh, he releases is uh, ambient. So, But I think a lot of the music, as we'll see today, mm. well, no, that's not fair because we actually have two very different albums mm-hmm. today, I would argue. We actually picked <laughs> maybe opposite ends of that. That That's exactly structure. what I was trying to do. Like when you picked your album first, yeah. I was like, I want to pick something to counterpart because my inclination was to pick one of the like building a better world, which is mm-hmm. very similar to your album in at least in genre. Like it, it's a different album, obviously, but like yeah, yeah, that like dream punk slash wavy mm-hmm. type stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. So I think probably then at that point it's best to maybe just discuss this yeah. in the context of those albums. Yeah. is a sample from track four of Do They Still Dream in Heaven by Panzer Paradise. The track is called Minus Hurt, all lowercase, one word. If you're unable to guess the genre, this is a, a Vapor Trap album. <laughs> uh, yeah, very different than what the Cat System Core does on his own. But I quite like this album. It is a album themed after the early 2000s internet. Specifically, the liner notes for the album talk about uh, dive into a world where the 2000s blend into a crazy sonic mix. This is a soundtrack for Kazaa, Facebook groups, and Flash. Press F in chat. <laughs> now, this is, it also says this is a thematic continuation of Panzer Paradise's last two albums, but I did not listen to those albums, and I, I'd never heard of Panzer Paradise before. Let's go check them out. Yeah, uh, I will have to do that later. I wanted to focus on this album uh, as a standalone work. We don't listen to a lot of Vapor Trap uh, on the show, Mm-mm. but, you know, I mean, I think it. this is a really good example of Vapor Trap. I mean, it, as you can ha- tell from the first sample, it is, it is trap. It is like hip hop beats with a lo-fi sensibility, but it's still got a lot of Vapor sensibility to it in terms of uh, a lot. I think the, the Vaporness comes in in a lot of the the segues and interruptions in in the beats. Uh, what, what, what are your initial impressions of the album? <laughs> Yeah, I guess I didn't even look that it was Vapor Trap at first until I went. I was like, oh, mm-hmm. I didn't even know that this was on Harry's Records, mm-hmm. this type of stuff. 
uh, it started, I'd say track one was probably my least favorite. Yeah. So at first I was a little unexcited. Mm-hmm. It was fine, but I just wasn't in the mood to listen to an album of rap. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Especially if it was all going to be that like lo-fi triplet flow type stuff, mm-hmm. which sounds cool, but like you hear a lot of, but, but thankfully that drops out pretty quick. And by the time we hit track four, mm-hmm. which was your, your opening sample, uh, I was into it. Like, I think it's actually, as far as Vapor Trap goes, much more chill to me mm-hmm. than I think of compared to like Blank Banshee or something Yeah, more yeah. I, I like iconically Vapor Trap. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's not nearly as manic as uh, Blank Banshee, I think. Uh, yeah. Maybe manic's a little too much, but yeah, it meant. Blank Banshee is definitely more frenetic than this. It's very bass heavy, but it is a bit, it is kind of chill. It, it mm-hmm. is kind of like you're relaxing in the VIP room at a club, not like mm-hmm. freaking out on the dance floor. Um, yeah. The, and also track one does have like an opening rap, which it was fine. But yeah, I was like, we didn't start this podcast to listen to, you know, people like mm-hmm. rapping or, or <laughs> singing like it, lyrics. Uh <laughs> That would be a separate podcast, yeah. which will be on Kickstarter in six <laughs> months. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think what stood out to me is that I feel like, especially based on the liner notes talking about like mm-hmm. Kazan and Flash and stuff, is that it does feel like the like inspiration or the the kind of targeted reference genre of that like late 90s, early aughts rapid R&B comes through more than another Vaporwave album. So like the synth harmonies on track four, the sample you played, Mm -hmm. they do sound very much like, like chorus harmonies that you would hear in like an R and B song, Mm -hmm. like the way the the chords kind of come together and like are voiced out. It just feels more like that. Like it just feels less like early nineties hip hop Mm -hmm. and, and more like early aughts. And I thought that was like an interesting divergence in terms of, of what we normally listen to when we get into vapor trap, which like you said, is not much. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought it was interesting that it kind of uh, targeted like it was like a MIDI version <laughs> yeah, of like a very different era mm-hmm. in hip hop's history. That's, that's a good point. I do want to mention the well, let, let, let me give these. I, I mentioned about like the segues in this album. Uh, I'm going to do a sample. Uh, so here, here's something to listen to. from track six land intermission and uh, i really like I, I wanted to get in that little chip tune sample that sort of bridge before it goes got into the beat so yeah there, there's a lot of this there's a lot of like weird samples from like uh, something from like it sounded like it from an old cartoon or something and japanese commercial samples it sounded like mm-hmm. yeah it's it's really cool it also kind of gives that like dreamy hazy view again like that sort of vapor wave or signal wave of like flipping through channels late at night uh, when you're when you're half awake, mm-hmm. just kind of vibing on the couch. So it's a really I, I I do like this and it makes me want to explore vapor trap more. But it is I I don't know um, I, I just like it uh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. Yeah, yeah. It's okay yeah. to just like a thing. Yeah. It it is kind of dreamy though, yeah. right? For sure. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Is I think what's interesting about it to me it kind of sits in like this space for me between what I, I normally think of as like vapor trap Mm -hmm. and what I think of as, as vaporwave and like a nice blend of genres. Cause it does have a lot of like the lo-fi or, or drum focused stuff, bass drum, heavy stuff, Mm -hmm. definitely some 808s in there, but also a lot of like those highly syncopated subdivided hi hats you hear a lot Mm -hmm. in trap. There's a lot of that type of stuff, Mm -hmm. but then it also has a lot of vaporwave elements. Like you're just talking about the samples there's a few times where it does like warbly tape glitch stuff, mm-hmm. like speed up, slow down type effects. 
like towards the end of track two. Uh, also, it's like, yeah, it's dreamy and chill. It has a lot of nostalgic kind of samples in it too. So around one minute into track 10, which is online comeback, <laughs> there's, I think of them as like choral, even though they're not trying to synthesize voices, mm-hmm. but there's just like these, these synth patches that I just feel like have been on Casio's forever. Yeah. And they just sound really, really familiar. And the album stays strong throughout. So like probably my favorite track is in the bonus tracks. Oh, yeah. uh, track 12, I think is really the real end track. Cause it's by LOL, mm-hmm. of course. Um, but then there's debug memory voice key gen, which is track 14. And like I could do probably a whole album of track 14. <laughs> <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I liked it too. Yeah. Uh, I really like the vocals in that. Yeah. It's just interesting. Like just, just super chill, but still kind of jammy driving, mm-hmm. not, not boring at all. And then uh, also in the bonus tracks, shout outs on the final track mm-hmm. by LL well for, for winter quilt showing up and doing a little, Vapor metal take on yeah, Winter Quill's back, baby. That's right. Yeah, see, I thought that was going to be your favorite track of the album, but uh, maybe I'm <laughs> maybe I'm just uh, pigeonholing you. Typecasting yeah, typecasting a little you. bit. Yeah, a little bit. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's very good. I definitely always like Winter Quilt's production. You know, your newer listener, Winter Quilt's album of Discordia was like my personal best of the year mm-hmm. when it came out. Yeah, and stuff. I, I love that album. Yeah, but I think what I loved about that album is a little different from what's in this track, Mm -hmm. which is that album had a lot of variety and a lot of vaporwave elements to it. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is more of having fun with doing like a metal cover. Ah, okay. Yeah. So it's a little, a little different to to be like a whole album of that type of stuff would be maybe a little harder. Okay. Unless I was like really just at the gym or like Mm -hmm. trying to stay hype. But I think my, my personal these days, day to day preference is, is more chill. And if it's not chill, then more like technically interesting, which also oh, Discordia also had a lot of different types of percussion breakdowns that, that really drew, drew me in. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. It's a great way to end an album. I'll have to say mm-hmm. just, just <laughs> thrash like hell, like right at the end and like, all right, now we're done. So it's very cool. So I did specifically choose this as a, as a way to like, I looked at like they, they not only have ambient on her Athel records, but like I saw future, at least one future funk album, and I was like, well, that'd mm-hmm. be fun. But like, then I saw this It's like, oh, OK. All right. This this will <laughs> this is more varied than what we've we've done before or like we've done much of. So uh, I'll, I'll revisit Vapor Trap. So, yeah, I am going to definitely look up Panzer Paradise's other works and see how they uh, hold up compared to this. But one thing just throughout the album is because there's all these samples and interruptions and sort of weird segues and, you know, like mm-hmm. um, it kind of gives it a, a scatterbrained feel to it, which I feel is like very appropriate for like this this idea of like the early 2000s internet where Mm -hmm. there's still a lot of weird like personal stuff going on it's not just the big five platforms there's still weird geo cities pages and uh shit like that and people are still doing weird things and it's a lot easier to for that kind of stuff to get be noticed and viral and like uh as opposed to if it's not on one of the big five sites it's not going to get popular at all you know yeah yeah so it's very cool a bit from track four hope and light off the album transition by destiny which is the latest release on here records which is why i chose it it's also a good choice because it's closer to what i thought of as their type of music Mm -hmm. which is this like dream wave dream punk slush wave slush punk pick all of your your combinations of those words 
mm-hmm. into kind of the modern version of vaporwave, kind of what what I I think of as as vaporwave in twenty twenty two. Yeah, like Harath Records. I you know when when it started it with uh, building a new world, you know an ambient album collaboration with Telepath. I just kind of pigeonholed it as a like oh there's gonna be an ambient record label you know a vapor ambient mm-hmm. dream punk ambient kind of thing like hke and kind of like how cryo chamber is started by dark ambient artists and it's very much a dark ambient label that's all mm-hmm. they do so this is like very this is very much the kind of album i would expect from them yeah for sure so this is an album by the Brazilian vaporwave artist Destiny. At least uh, they also go by Zero because like their tag mm-hmm. on Twitter is like I am Zero Music mm. or like Welcome to Zero Music. It comes up a lot. Mm-hmm. Coincidentally, talking about artists founding record labels, they are the co-founder themselves of a record label, <laughs> Atmo, which is Atmospheric Transcendental Music Online, Ooh. which is itself a sub-label of Vaporwave Tapes Brazil, which is a Brazilian, both being Brazilian record labels to release atmospheric and vaporwave music. Oh, neat. Not so too. So this is the the latest album. This is a classic concept album about the fall or collapse of like, uh, utopia is probably a strong word, mm-hmm. but the liner notes describe having this um, very high technologically advanced society that sort of collapses through environmental destruction, privation, and mankind's self-destructive nature. Mm. So, hmm, perhaps a timely release. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, the artist paints an epic portion, the slow degradation and collapse of a fruitful society and the privation of its positive energy. Mm -hmm. And you hear this, right? So this album is is big and getting into the music, it's big and wide and atmospheric, especially for the first six tracks or so. Mm Mm-hmm. And then the track six, which is called Change Point or Changes, ends with actually some of this vapor trap kind of comes in. Yeah, I noticed that. I was like, huh, all right. Interesting. Yeah, I did notice the beats as, as, as they they stood out a lot to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the the just broadly speaking, before we get into individual tracks or, or aspects, I like mm-hmm. the back half kind of seven through 13 is still these big and atmospheric, but it starts to really degrade. Mm-hmm. It starts to be more ominous. Sometimes chord choices are like more dissonant. There's more heavy drums. Some stuff is crackly and staticky or industrial. Yeah. yeah. And it sort of slowly kind of devolves into that to the track 13 is um, into the darkest destiny is very intense, like static drone noise over yeah, like a faint background of, these synth leads throughout the album that you kind of hear. So that's, that's really how the album maps that collapse from, from beginning to end. Yeah. I did notice the drone and industrial elements really kicking in, in the second half of the album. So um, Mm -hmm. even on a casual listen, it's very obvious that, you know, the narrative arc of this, it begins so much like a, like a 2814 album. Like, you know, the, the opening track, it sound reminded me a lot of like a bright new day um, in terms of its lushness. Mm. Like that's the word I would associate most with this is just lush. Like it's these super dense soundscapes, uh, but that kind of gradually disappears. And like, yep. yeah. Uh, so I thought that was a very cool way to tell a story through uh, the album. Yeah. The first three tracks are all these big lush chill tracks. Mm-hmm. And it got me thinking about what the musical equivalent is. Uh, I'm sure somebody knows they can probably just tell us, but like, what is the musical equivalent of semiotics? Right. Mm-hmm. Because uh, I don't know how much of that is having read the liner notes and looking at the album cover, but they do feel like the kind of big musical language that is used whenever you're looking at like future landscapes. Mm-hmm. Like I'm going to bring it up only because they tag it, but it does feel like very Blade Runner, not because it sounds like a Vangelis song, mm-hmm. but it does feel like these big atmospheric music that would play like over a pan of future LA or something. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, I was wondering about like if people have done much research or written much about the way signs and symbols in music manifest similar to, to text or other imagery. Yeah. It's interesting that ambient as a genre is so often associated with utopia and dystopia in one way or the other. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the politics of ambient and yeah, how it's been shaped by like movies, like you said, Blade Runner, like how, how often has that 
Mm-hmm. That, that that cultural signifier has come through, and uh, now that type of music is associated with that type of like story and imagery. That would, yeah, that uh, God, you, there is a book in there, isn't there? Uh, of just probably, yeah. and I'm sure people have have written it uh, at least papers on this. I mean, mm-hmm. I can't, I refuse to believe that that's not a, a previously researched subject. Yeah, but it is. Mm-hmm. It is interesting. Mm-hmm. No. It's, so other stuff on this album I really like. I think there's a lot of really cool synth work. I, I think it's all synth work. There's some that sound like guitar adjacent. I don't know if they're like a really good synth patch or a guitar playthrough. Yeah, the guitar the gu- guitar in the opening tracks are really noticeable to me. I, I, I thought they were mm-hmm. real, but like, yeah, it could be synth. It's hard to tell. Well, they can be real, but also like the guitar has become such an electric instrument mm-hmm. in the past 10 years. There's so much like real-time processing that, that people can do where you can be playing a guitar, mm-hmm. but you can get such an incredible range of sounds out of it that you couldn't 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. Because there's all these post-processing effects like we've just gotten good enough at the hardware mm. to do that so an unrelated example is like uh tosin abasi who's the lead guitarist or one of the two lead guitarists i should say for animals as leaders which is like a progressive metal band mm. he makes so many weird sounds with his guitar just because he has all these weird like patches in his pedal board oh yeah and stuff yeah. so i i don't know i i assume they're guitar too so an example would be in track one and then this middle part i also really liked from track five It's one of my favorite things. It's so simple, but I do love in these big atmospheric songs when the like singular guitar or singular synth lead or, or something just like cuts through all that haze, Mm -hmm. like just beacons its way through the mix Mm -hmm. to you. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know why. I just, I just really love that effect. Well, it's really cool just to hear anything, like any, any kind of well-made music that has like things in multiple like ranges not not, not just like mm-hmm. bass but like something in the treble in the mid and like when it all comes together mm-hmm. and like in either a really cool harmony or sort of a weird dissonance like it's uh depending on how you do it it, it uh it's ah it's all coming together you know like yeah it's just that creation of of layers and craft mm-hmm. and and production mm-hmm. it's just a mistake well like it just hits you yeah. like you just know that mm-hmm. it's it's well done yeah so another great example, just to, to cram another quick sample in here, is this part from track 11 in Humanity. So this is the synth lead that comes in about two minutes into the track mm-hmm. against these these heavy active drums. And this is just another example where that synth lead is powerful and cutting through, but it's doing it in a very different context because the background is less tranquil mm-hmm. and more industrial and, and active. There's a lot more going on in the drums in that track. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, for an ambient album, it is it is quite active. It is not like, you know, so many ambient albums are just, you know, soundscapes and just gently, you know, fading in and out of different synth pads. But there's actual drums in this, you know, like there's actually like a bit of more complexity. So I appreciated that. For sure. It's interesting because I, I was actually concerned whether or not I would like this album, mm -hmm. I guess, to be honest, only because I do feel like I've listened to a lot of this stuff. <laughs> It's it's very much in the I think he's influenced by Cat System Corp and, and Telepath and 2814 and HKE and all these other like, you know, HKE, we, we, we laugh at mm. like, you know, his, his vitriol. But like he did really kind of pioneer a new type of sound for ambient of like a lush, dense kind of soundscape that sounds like a city and a jungle at the same time. And I think that's influencing a lot of artists. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, I don't think you'd have this album without a bright new day, for example. So it's possible. I I think though that it absolutely still makes it its own thing. Oh, sure. Like it doesn't feel derivative at all. No, no. I I was just worried that I personally had gotten bored of the genre. Mm -hmm. Okay. Me as a listener, not like independent of the actual quality mm -hmm. of the album. Sure. Yeah, I ended up really liking having this on, and I think I it kind of has inspired me to go back and maybe look over the last, I don't know, six months to a year's worth of slush wave stuff mm -hmm. or, or dream punk stuff that I've kind of skipped because I was just listening to other things. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought I wanted to listen to. So it's definitely rekindled my enjoyment of the genre and makes me want to go explore more of it that I've no doubt missed. Yeah. I do like uh, on the tags on this, it has, because drags are marked, uh, as we said, tags and genres are marketing terms more than anything else. But it's not only listed as ambient and uh, dream punk, which makes sense, and vaporwave, obviously. But it's also tagged as Blade Runner and synthwave. <laughs> and I would not say this is synthwave, but like I could see a synthwave fan liking this if they want something more ambient. And like I, I just like the idea that Blade Runner is its own genre. It is <laughs> now, and when you look on it, there's actually like uh, about like twenty albums on Bandcamp tagged with Blade Runner. So yeah, it's. Yeah, which is interesting yeah. because musically, it does not try to rip off Blade mm -hmm. Runner like so much stuff does. Like so much stuff tries to do that Vangelis CS80 synth mm -hmm. tone. And this doesn't. It's totally its own. It's totally exists in its own space. Yeah, no, it, it, you're right. It does. But like at the same time, someone who likes Vangelis Blade Runner uh, would mm -hmm. like this too. Between this and like aliens informing the visual language of space sci-fi dark sci-fi from its release to now like not just in movies but in tv and uh, video games and tabletop role-playing games and like so many things like uh blade runner and aliens have just like this is what sci-fi this is what the future looks like more than like uh, in a lot of ways like star trek or star wars again uh something that could be a book but like i just find like blade runner is still it's it's a thing in Blade Runner is the kind of thing that like influences the people who make art more than like the general public. Mm. And so and it probably resonates because it's unfortunately much easier to imagine some rundown corporate dystopia mm -hmm. than kind of unity politics or something like Star Trek. Yeah, no, true. I mean, even in yeah, in, in Destiny, it, talk, it talks about a failed utopia, like uh, something that was uh, an amazing society then collapses, which. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, a utopian empire, the destruction of a utopian empire and the sublime work, uh, the dismantling of a world told through lashings of atmospheric ambient and dreamy electronic instrumentation. So, yeah, uh, it says a lot about us and society. <laughs> <laughs> sure does. In any case, both albums we discussed today are fantastic and you should absolutely check them out. Thanks so much for listening. Hope you inspired you to go check out whatever music interests you on Here Earth Records. Next episode, we're going to be getting into a genre slash unofficial genre that we discussed before. We're doing business or corporate focused vaporwave, which we've done a little bit 
on previous episodes, but it probably deserves its own mm-hmm. deep dive. Yeah. Get back into some of the, the nuts and bolts of uh, Vaporwave as criticism. Yeah. These are uh, both newer albums and uh, mm-hmm. one of them has a great like uh music video or it, it, it's an ad for the album done as like a late night TV ad. Like <laughs> do you want the new nice. music? Like, yeah, it's great. So I'm very excited to dive into those albums. Yeah. So that'll be fun. If you want to listen to more of what we do, we have a ton of bonus albums on our bonus episodes, rather mm-hmm. on our Patreon, which is night clerk radio at patreon.com. If you want to talk to us in any capacity, it's probably best to hit us up on Twitter at Nightclerk Radio. Ross is at Ross Payton. I am at Burke McBurkinson. We're also at Nightclerk Radio pretty much everywhere else you could look. Uh, NightclerkRadio.com, Nightclerk Radio on Facebook, our defunct Instagram page, et cetera, et cetera. It's everywhere, mm-hmm. anywhere you want to be. Wherever you do choose to interact with Nightclerk Radio, just take a moment to rate, review, comment, whatever. You can to tell the algorithm that you're <laughs> engaging with us and other people should as well. Mm-hmm. And really the most important part of that is just word of mouth. Just talking to other people about your interests, make some friends, chat about podcasts, chat about music, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks again. Bye. <laughs>